Okay, so SF Baykeeper, Sejal Choksi Chu, Executive Director, she's going to talk about the state of the Bay in 2021. Take it away, and uh, you should be able to share your screen if you'd like to. Terrific. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jonathan. All right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to my presentation. Thank you for having me at your meeting, letting me crash. Um, I just realized that I recognize some faces and names. So just so that I can get a good sense for who I'm talking to. Um, if you're already a Baykeeper member or supporter or you know, kind of know about us already and have interacted with us at an event or something, could you just put a one in the chat and let me see uh, who I'm talking to in this big group. Um, if I'm preaching to the choir, I'll change my messages. <laughs> and if, I, if I've got a brand new audience, uh, that's good too, because then I have lots more to say. <laughs> um, oh my God, awesome. All right, Ellen, Kim, Krista. Oh, hey, Krista. Um, yeah, Vicki, Trev, uh, Tim, Jacob. Okay, awesome. It looks like we have a, a big crowd of Baykeeper supporters. So I am so happy to have you here tonight. And I promise this will be interesting for you. And it'll hopefully also be interesting for all of those of you who may not be as familiar with our work. Um, and I hope that by the end of this presentation, you might be inspired to learn more about us. Um, so as you might imagine, Baykeeper receives an awful lot of invitations, especially during Earth Month, to come speak about the Bay and tell companies and corporate employees all about um, how they can keep the Bay healthy and protected. And uh, we have to prioritize and we have to decline some of those because there's just too many. But I have to say, just between us, if you could keep this quiet and keep this here, that'd be great. Um, when I got the invitation from Margot to come speak to you guys tonight, I was like, yes, no way am I declining this one. Uh, you guys are they're some of my favorite people on the Bay. Um, so I'm really glad to be here tonight. And I want to thank you before we get started, um, because you guys are on the water. You appreciate the Bay already. And, uh, you know, I kind of do feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. Uh, when I talk about how precious and important the Bay is for, for us and for the Bay Area, you guys are on the water and connected to it already, and obviously terrific stewards for the Bay. So thank you guys for all that you do. And um, again, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, so I'm going to get started, and hopefully we'll have time for questions and discussion at the end. You can also feel free to chat in the in while I'm talking, I'm happy to try to keep an eye on that or have Jonathan ask questions uh, if they are pertain to what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, just to give you guys a little sense for who I am, um, I am the executive director of San Francisco Baykeeper. Um, I grew up in Atlanta um, and right outside of Atlanta. And this is a picture actually of my um, hometown. And that little red dot is my high school. Um, and that big gray monstrosity next to my high school is a big asphalt quarry that's still there and still operational. Um, every day after school, I would walk outside school and there would be a film of black, brown, yucky dust over everything. And we were breathing it in. And every day that just made me so mad. I was like, why is this big corporation allowed to pollute our community, my school, all of my friends, and make us unhealthy. Um, we, my family in particular, experienced a lot of health problems, as did um, a lot of my, my neighbors. Um, so this was an issue that was just really upsetting to me. And at that time, you know, <laughs> I could date myself a little bit. At that time, you know, back in the 1990s, um, there was not really social media. There wasn't really a way for me to feel like I could do anything about it and, and get people engaged. So I kind of channeled that energy and took it to law school <laughs> instead. I said, how do I stop polluters? Um, and it seemed like the law was a good way to try to figure out how to do that. So I came out to law school at Cal and I fell in love with the Bay the minute I got here. Um, and then I haven't left since. Um, I specialized in environmental law when I was in law school and I got 
a position with Baykeeper, a fellowship right out of law school. And I've seriously been at Baykeeper ever since. So 18 years, <laughs> really passionate about the mission. And um, hopefully after tonight, you understand a little bit about why I've been there so long. Um, so the Bay is beautiful. You guys all know that. Um, and there are three really commonly held beliefs about the Bay. Um, the Bay is healthy and clean. There are lots of laws that protect the Bay and they're, and they're good, strong laws. And there are government agencies that defend the Bay and help us protect it. Um, so I want you guys to be uh, totally honest and tell me which of these is the true statement. And it could be all of them. You could think that all of them are true or you might know which one is true. Number one. <laughs> Number one. Okay. You can also enter in the chat if you want. Um, or you can you can shout out. That's beautiful too. Actually, all three of them are true to some degree. Okay. I like that answer. That's the literally answer. <laughs> all right. Um, seeing a few responses in the chat, maybe. Um, seems like a lot of people really believe maybe one is true. Okay, I see some threes in there. Government agencies protect the Bay. Um, yeah, so, um, oh, Olga, I like your answer. All right, I'm here to tell you, and we can feel free to argue in, in, in the discussion portion of this event afterwards, um, that none of these are true. <laughs> Um, but I, I will go with the other answer as well. Um, they're all true to an extent and, and there are limitations on that. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. So first of all, the bay looks beautiful, but it's actually not very healthy. Um, and that's partly our fault. <laughs> it's partly because it's a very urban area and there are more than 7 million people that live around the bay. We have lots and lots of, lots of cities that have stormwater systems that drain directly into the bay. We have lots of wastewater treatment plants. We have the over 1, 1,500 um, industrial facilities that operate all around the bay area. We have five oil refineries, um, more than 380 boats, vessels, cargo tankers, everything is on the bay every day going across. Um, some of you might not know this, but we have hundreds of toxic sites, over a thousand toxic sites that are right on the Bay's shoreline. And in combination with that, we're anticipating a pretty significant rise in sea level over the next hundred years. So there are lots of threats to the Bay. And um, that is something that people don't always realize when they're commuting on the bay, they're looking um, looking at the bay and enjoying its beauty. Um, they don't always think about these threats to the bay, but we are. <laughs> so uh, at Baykeeper, our team of scientists, lawyers, advocates, and skippers are always defending the bay from these threats and we're holding polluters and agencies accountable. So I'm gonna jump into a little bit about how we do that. Um, we have five core program areas. We investigate pollution, we stop polluters, we strengthen the laws because unfortunately they are not strong enough and they get weakened all the time. We fight for our communities and we defend the resilience of the Bay. So these are all the resources that make up the Bay. And a few of the ways that we do some of these things. I'm gonna give you guys some examples. So um, we investigate pollution because we believe that pollution shouldn't go not investigated. People should be looking out and, and following up on what that, what that pollution is and who's causing it. Um, and that's sort of what makes up Baykeeper. Baykeeper was founded 30 years ago by a scientist on a boat who was seeing pollution every time he was out on the water. And um, I, I often joke that Mike Hers, Dr. Mike Hers, um, really was just looking for a way to spend more time on his boat when he created Baykeeper 
30 years ago, um, but there's nothing wrong with that. And he certainly started a model of investigating pollution very early on. So even today, we have a patrol boat that is on the water regularly. We have a core team of 12 volunteer skippers who run the patrol boat for us. And uh, during COVID times, we had the opportunity to expand our pol uh, pollution patrols to drones. So we have been using drone patrols now to take a look at those polluters who are not very visible from the water. And uh, honestly, you'd kind of be surprised. You guys are out on the bay often, so you may have seen this, but some of the industrial facilities especially have started putting up these big walls. So you can't even see what's on the other side of the wall, what their, what their facilities are doing, what their operations are. Um, and so these drones that we have now are just amazing, great, um, great visuals and, and being able to see exactly what they're doing and they can't get, they can't hide from us is, is how we like to think about it. So um, a quick story about some of this work. Um, we have uh, a number of scientists on staff and then a number who are affiliated with us. And um, one story is when Ian, who's down in this bottom left picture on your screen, um, was on a patrol a few years ago. He saw the um, red plume that you're seeing right here in the water. And he noticed that and said, well, well, that doesn't belong in the bay. And so he took a sample without really knowing what it was. And then he and the skipper followed it up, upstream. They, they kind of followed to the shoreline where it was coming from. And they discovered that it was coming from a facility called BAE. And some of you guys might be familiar with this facility. It was a facility that used to be on the San Francisco shoreline um, right near um, the marina. Uh, uh, the, the name of the marina is totally escaping me, obviously, because I'm being put on the spot, putting myself on the spot. Um, it'll come to me in a second. Um, but the, that one, um, this facility basically was a dry dock facility that was pulling in all of the big ships and vessels into their dry dock, pulling them out of the water, and then they were doing maintenance on them. And that maintenance included sandblasting the sides of them and then recoating the paint. And that is what we found in the water that day. They were sandblasting the bottom of a big ferry boat and that paint was being allowed to just get into the water. So it's, if you guys know, I'm sure you do, um, boat paint is highly toxic. I mean, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be toxic to living creatures because that prevents growth on the bottom of boats. Um, so it's got lots of copper and other heavy metals. And sure enough, that's what we found in, this, uh, in the samples that Ian took that day. So um, we ended up researching that facility and discovering that they had hundreds of pollution violations that were self-reported. So this means under the Clean Water Act, these kinds of facilities are supposed to be reporting the kind of pollution that they're um, contributing to the Bay. And then they're supposed to be taking steps to stop that pollution. But what's happening in many cases is that these pollution reports that are required under the Clean Water Act are filed by the polluter and then the government agency used to just put them in a filing cabinet, shut the door, and they would just collect dust and nobody would ever look at them again. Um, now it's all electronic and so nobody clicks on them anymore. <laughs> so um, they don't collect dust as much, but they, they still do sit um, un, unlooked at until Baykeeper comes around. So we uh, went through all of the pollution reports from this facility, discovered that they had hundreds of violations and ended up holding them accountable under the Clean Water Act and saying that you guys cannot operate this way. You have to implement um, best practices to make sure that their pollution is not getting into the bay. And they did that. They, they ended up cleaning up their facility, putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into their site to make sure that they were a clean facility. Um, and then a few years later, the story ends with them actually getting shut down for other violations that had to do uh, nothing with the environmental issues that they were having. So the city of San Francisco actually ended up 
how to, to shutting them down um, permanently. So um, that's just one example of how we have um, a lot of polluters on the Bay of Shoreline and you guys being on the water, you know, you've seen your share of those operations. Um, what we do of those 1,640 facilities, our scientists actually run them through a list and, and um, create the top polluters in the Bay. They end up discovering um, who the top 50 polluters are. And then our lawyers will go through that information, go through the records and see whether it makes sense to follow up with a, with a Clean Water Act lawsuit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right, so let me forward. So that's how we stop polluters. And um, that's one of the ways that we identify polluters because we believe that both polluters and government agencies need to be held accountable. Um, one example of how we've held uh, government agencies accountable, um, some of you may be familiar with the Ghost Fleet. Uh, these were old military vessels that were decommissioned. And what the uh, federal government of the agency called MARAD was doing with these vessels is they were putting them um, in the bay, in Sassoon Bay, and just storing them there. They, they were giving the public the excuse that, you know, maybe one day, if, if it's wartime, we might pull these vessels back into action and need them. So we need to store them. In reality, what was happening is that these vessels were falling apart and they were not being maintained. And there was actually no way they could be put back into action. Um, so we ended up finding a study that NOAA put out that showed that these vessels were actually contributing 20 tons of toxic metals in the bay, and that um, didn't even include the PCBs that they were contributing to the bay and the hazardous oils and other fluids that they were contributing to the Bay. So it was basically a toxic junkyard that the federal government had created in the Bay. Um, and we identified 57 different vessels that were so badly worn that they could never be put back in action. And we held Marad accountable. And we said, you guys need to follow your own law, the Clean Water Act. You cannot be polluting the Bay with these contaminants. Um, and you need to clean up these vessels. And so over a four year period, Marad ended up moving all of those vessels to recycling facilities and getting all of those 57 ships broken down one by one. Um, and now if you go by that area, you've probably noticed that there are just maybe two or three vessels left out there. Those are actually active vessels that can be put back into um, action and the, the um, federal government has required, is required to follow Clean Water Act measures to keep pollution from coming off of those existing boats into the water. And one of my favorite stories about that lawsuit that Baykeeper brought um, a few years ago is that the federal government not only cleaned up our ghost fleet here in the Bay, but they realized that they were liable, potentially liable in other parts of the country where they were doing the same thing because the Clean Water Act all obviously applies to other waters of the United States. And so they actually took the measures that, that we required them to take here and applied them to the other junk fleet vessels across the country. So I was a little bit proud that our, our teeny tiny little organization at Baykeeper was able to have a, a nationwide impact like that. Um, and you know that does happen sometimes. So that, that was really fun. Um, we can't do a lot of the work that we do without the laws being strong. Um, they have to be strong and enforceable in order to protect people and wildlife. And case in point, back in 2007, I'm sure many of you guys who were here at the time remember the Costco Busan oil spill. I don't know if you remember where you were when you heard about the oil spill. I remember vividly, I was at the dentist's office and I hate being at the dentist's office but I hate oil spills even more. I would much rather be in the dentist's office than getting the calls that I was getting that morning. 
um, I was getting calls from the media saying, what do you know about this oil spill? And, you know, at first the Coast Guard was reporting it's 400 gallons, nothing to see here, folks. Um, and so our, one of our skippers called me and said, hey, you know, I'm, kind of, I'm free right now. Do you want me to just go out on the boat and check it out and see what they're up to? And I said, that'd be great. I'm stuck at the dentist. It would be great if you could go out there. Um, and so they, he went out there and he called me about an hour later and he's like, Sajel, there's something wrong because I am here on the bay and seeing oil all over the place where it should not be if this was a 400 gallon oil spill that was contained. And so I started calling the media, my staff started calling the Coast Guard and the company, and we were asking a lot of questions. We're like, well, how do you know it's a small oil spill? How do you know that it's all contained? What proof do you have? And sure enough, eight hours later, the Coast Guard went on to TV and said, whoopsie, we made a mistake. The company has reevaluated how much oil spilled into the bay. It wasn't 400 gallons, it was 53,000 gallons. You know, that's just a rounding error. <laughs> so we were just horrified by that because eight hours late is too late to be able to contain or clean up any of that oil. So by the next morning, 50 beaches were closed, thousands of birds were covered in oil, and those thousands of birds died. Um, we were looking at a major oil disaster in the Bay, and one that really was preventable. So after that event, um, Baykeeper actually worked with the Coast Guard and other oil spill agencies, you know, kind of sitting in a room around a table dissecting what happened during that oil spill and how it could have been prevented and how it could have been responded to better. And um, we came up with 191 ways in which oil spill response should be improved. Um, so since then, Baykeeper has taken um, some of those recommendations and turned them into laws. So um, some of the oil spill prevention kind of loopholes and, and problems have been strengthened now, which is great. And most recently, last year, we actually ended up passing a bill to prevent heavy tar sands from being transported on the bay without adequate measures. And so this is, if you guys aren't familiar, this is the tar sands oil that comes from Alberta, Canada. Um, the oil industry has been trying to find ways to export it out of the country um, and get it refined. And California's refineries and the Bay Area's refineries in particular are well equipped to handle heavy oils. And so they were trying to bring more than 150 tankers of heavy tar sands oil onto the Bay every year and expand oil refining of this really toxic heavy crude. Um, and what we discovered is that this oil, if it gets in a waterway, just sinks. It doesn't float like the picture that you see here. It just sinks. And that means that the entire bottom of the bay is smothered in oil and they don't have any equipment or any technology to clean that stuff up, as we've seen from a spill that happened in Michigan a few years ago. So um, we said, oh no, you cannot use the bay as a, your experiment ground for new technologies. You cannot transport tar sands oil on the bay unless you know exactly how you're cleaning it up and you've got proven technologies to do that. You also have to notify your, um, ag our agencies that you are planning on transporting this oil because right now the oil industry shields itself behind um, laws that are uh, trade secrets. They're, they're not going to tell us, even the first responders, what kind of oil they're transporting. It just says oil. Um, and so there's not really a good way for any of the, the agencies to be able to respond to a spill immediately. So we closed that loophole and made sure that um, tar sands are not going to be a problem for the Bay. And so that, that just happened last year. One example. Um, all right, so we also work to fight for communities because we definitely believe that everyone has a right to clean water and a selfie, safe and healthy bay. Um, I wanted to share with you guys, you may, you may have seen in the news, um, there are 
coal interests that are trying to bring 11 million tons of coal from Utah and export it out of California. And they don't really care where they're, they're exporting it from. Um, they just want to get it out while there's still demand for coal. So in Richmond, we have one facility that is already equipped to export coal. And what they've been trying to do is increase exports from the city of Richmond at this one facility. Now, little did the coal industry know that Baykeeper had already sued that facility and already held that facility accountable and made them clean up their act. So when we heard that they were going to more than uh, quintuple the amount of coal that they were bringing through this little facility in Richmond, we immediately got involved and said, this facility is not, is not able to handle that much coal cleanly. It is gonna have an impact on the Bay and it's gonna have an impact on the community because when these coal trains come into the community, as you can see here, they're open because coal can't be covered, it's combustible. So on that long trip from Utah, it has to be open and some government agency studies estimate that these coal trains lose about 500 tons of coal in transit on the way to the Bay Area. So where is that coal going? It's going into the communities that the trains are going through. It's going into the Bay. It's going into tributaries of the Bay. Um, and so we didn't want these coal trains coming in. And because this facility is so small, it can only have a certain number of ships loading a year. And so the, the facility was basically storing these coal trains in the community and allowing all of this coal dust to enter the community and really impact the Richmond community, which is already overburdened by pollution from a lot of industry. So um, we stood with all of the community groups there. There's no coal in Richmond and others um, to help pass a ban last year. Um, on storage of coal in the city of Richmond. And so now this facility has, I believe it's three years to stop storing coal at, in the city of Richmond at all, which is awesome. Um, unfortunately, as you guys know, the coal industry didn't just take that lightly. They took the city of Richmond to court over the ban uh, saying it was illegal. Um, we actually, Baykeeper and our attorneys actually stood up in court with Richmond and are def helping to defend Richmond. Um, so that's been a good team effort. Um, and we're working with Sierra Club and Earth Justice on that lawsuit. Um, and then uh, we recently uh, won the state level um, lawsuit on that issue. So now we just have to get over the federal hurdle. So hopefully that's in the works and will be successful this year. Similarly, that same thing is happening in Oakland. As you guys might know, um, Oakland is trying to build a coal, a coal export facility, um, as is Vallejo. This one is little known. Uh, the city of Vallejo was also experiencing a big pressure to develop a coal export facility. And uh, we worked with local community groups in both Oakland and in Vallejo to stop those in their tracks as well. The Oakland one is still being litigated. We're, we're working on that and supporting the, the groups there and the city of Oakland. Um, the Vallejo one seems dead in the water so far, but who knows when the coal industry will try to rear its ugly head. And we just learned last week that they, the coal industry is now actually targeting Humboldt Bay as a possible export site. Um, so that means coal trains could possibly come through the Bay Area, go up to Arcata and be exported there. So we are working with our Humboldt Baykeeper to stop that project as well. Um, okay, that might be all I have to say about coal. Coal is bad, it's really toxic. Okay, um, and finally, Baykeeper works really hard to defend the Bay's resources because if they're not healthy, then the Bay cannot be resilient to climate change. And this is a um, hard topic for me to talk about, mostly because I want to talk about too many different things. When I talk about um, the Bay needs to be healthy, I mean the Bay needs freshwater flows to have a good balance of ocean water and freshwater 
because that makes the briny water that, that is special and unique to the bay and the bay's habitat. Um, but freshwater flows are being diverted for big ag and mega cities that are taking way too much water and not enough fresh water is coming into the bay. So Baykeeper is at the forefront of that fight and working to, to keep freshwater flows and increase freshwater flows into the bay and the delta. Um, you guys also probably realize that the, the bay's sediment needs to be intact and healthy in order for the bay to be healthy. Um, and that includes the sand. So um, there are companies that actually pull sand out of the bay and sell it for a profit to make cement and concrete. And if you've heard of, of this issue, you know, sand is a, is a big um, commodity all over the world and it's um, stolen from beaches. And there's a whole issue down in Monterey of um, taking too much sand out of the, off the beach there. A lot of people don't realize that that's actually happening right in San Francisco Bay as well. So this sand comes from the Delta and lands around the um, Angel Island area. And then it's supposed to naturally attenuate out through the Golden Gate and replenish the, the sand on the beaches, on the coastal beaches. But our coastal beaches, as you guys know, are experiencing incredible rates of erosion. And that's partly because the sand is being stopped from getting out to the Golden Gate. It's being pulled out of the bay and used for cement, sold for a profit by these companies. So a few years ago, Baykeeper brought a lawsuit. I actually think that this was um, a hot off the press lawsuit the last time I spoke to the Basque group because I had a lot of interest in this case in particular from you guys. Um, so uh, here's the end result of our litigation. Um, we fought the State Lands Commission and the sand mining companies in court and we had a very novel argument. We said that that sand belongs to the people of the Bay Area. It is not for these private companies to sell for a profit. And if the State Lands Commission wants to allow this stuff to be sold for a profit, they have to prove that that is a public interest, that that, that sand is being sold um, in the public trust and, and it's a public trust resource. And so, we took that to court, the State Lands Commission fought us, the, the sand mining company fought us, and we um, basically went back and forth between the lower court and the appellate court fighting the case. Um, and then two years ago, no, last year, gosh, I'm losing track of time, last year, um, Baykeeper won. The court agreed with us and said, the sand in the bay belongs to the people, it is a public trust resource and must be protected. Um, so now we are working on what does that look like? The court didn't get its hands dirty, so to speak. They didn't um, delve into the science and say, well, this is how much sand you're allowed to take from the bay. They left that up to the experts. And so now our scientists are sitting with the agency scientists and public scientists and thinking about how much sand is it appropriate to take out of the bay and how much do we actually need in the bay for the, the health of the bay and obviously Baykeeper is fighting for as much sand to stay in the bay as possible because that's what's going to be a healthy bay area. Um, and this is the same sand that goes to the shoreline of the bay as well, replenishing our wetlands, replenishing our beaches. So it's really important and really should not be messed with. Um, similarly, you guys may have seen in the news recently, um, Baykeeper was the lead plaintiff on the case against the Cargill salt ponds. So Cargill for decades has been trying to develop the ponds in the South Bay. These are the ponds that they use to um, crystallize salt and then make salt from, but they've become, you know, out of, they've gone out of use. And so now Cargill is thinking, well, what if we just fill them all in and sell it to the highest bidder and let them pave over it and build luxury condos and retail stores. That's a great idea on former wetlands area, right? Who thinks that's a great idea? Raise your hands. Um, so uh, a few years ago under the Trump administration, Cargill had a willing partner in at EPA and they convinced EPA to say, what, what these ponds are not water, their land. Who, who said their water? So the Clean Water Act doesn't apply to land. So 
you go ahead, Cargill. You don't need any permits or permission um, under the Clean Water Act to pave over these ponds. They're, they're land. Um, so being the ridiculous nonsensical argument that that is, Baykeeper immediately jumped on that and took that to court. We took EPA and Cargill to court. Last fall, we won, not surprisingly, the judge in the court um, issued his opinion and said, ponds are wet. <laughs> they are hydrologically connected to the bay. <laughs> what is this nonsense argument? Get it out of my courtroom. <laughs> so we were um, very happy that common sense ruled the day. Um, and those 1300 acres of salt ponds have been protected up until now. We know because Cargill has been trying these shenanigans for decades that they're probably not gonna give up so easily. Um, so we're gearing up for the next battle, but I'm so grateful that we won that one because that would have been crazy <laughs> to, to have a judge say anything other than ponds are wet. <laughs> okay, so now you have a little sense for what I mean by investigating pollution, stopping polluters, strengthening laws, fighting for communities and defending Bay resilience. And the underlying principle of all of that is that we believe no one should be allowed to harm our beautiful Bay. And that's why we exist and do our work. So um, just really quickly, we have had over 30 years of impact. Um, over 16,000 hours on patrol, over 300 legal victories. Um, we've held 20 cities accountable, reducing sewage spills in the Bay, which if you're a Bay kayaker, you should really care about. Um, three coal facilities have been blocked. We've cleaned up Point Malade Beach in Richmond and made that uh, the first publicly accessible beach in the city of Richmond. Um, we helped pass 14 new oil spill laws. We've helped protect those salt ponds. Um, and something that a lot of people don't realize about our work is that when we file lawsuits against polluters, we, uh, we issue or we get big penalties against those polluters for polluting the bay. And Baykeeper doesn't accept any of that money. So we send that all to nonprofit organizations around the bay who are working to restore the health of the bay in other ways. Um, so we get a lot done. All right, oops, why has this gotten out of order? Oops, sorry guys, where did my thing go? Okay, so you can get involved. Um, you can donate and become a keeper. We have almost 20 people, I think, in this group already who are members. So thank you guys so much for supporting this work. And I encourage anyone who's interested after this presentation or otherwise loves the Bay to join us. Um, you can also sign up for our monthly newsletters because that's a great way to hear all of these little stories in, uh, in live news. So you guys will be up to date on the latest happenings on the Bay if you sign up for the newsletters. Um, and because you guys are on the water, I would love to share with you our pollution hotline. It's 1-800-KEEP-BAY. And hopefully that's easy enough to remember. Um, if you see pollution while you're out on the water, definitely call that number and report it. You can also report it on our website. We will follow up. And if it's a, a ongoing issue, we will make sure that the government agencies are following up on it or we will follow up on it ourselves. Um, and you can volunteer and take action. So we often have volunteer events, especially during non-pandemic times. Um, and we have action alerts on our website that you can sign up for to know what kinds of things to, to send letters to your city council on or to take action to stop coal, the coal facilities from being able to expand. We have all kinds of actions like that that happen constantly around the Bay Area. Um, and we're always looking for ambassadors. So if you think you have some expertise on the Bay that you're able to share with us, um, reach out to me anytime. I'd love to have you guys think about joining our advisory board. Um, okay, and then one special way right now that you can actually protect the bay is to drink wine. Maybe you like wine. You can drink rosé for the bay, which is our wine that Obsidian Wine Company creates for us. So you can go to Obsidian Wine Co. Um, and purchase this beautiful rosé. It's delicious. 
and a hundred percent of the proceeds come back to Baykeeper. So who knew that drinking wine and protecting the bay could be so fun? Okay, thank you. This is my email address in case you guys have any questions um, later. And I'm also happy to take questions now. Oh, oh good. I didn't go over. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. Hi, Ellen and Tom. Oh. Um, I live in Berkeley, and um, I've, I've read over the years about all the, the sewage spills that happen into the bay, especially in the winter when we get rains. And as a kayaker, it's really a concern because um, you can really get badly infected by stuff in raw sewage. That, that When there's a lot of rain that the sewage treatment plants can't handle it, and they just release the stuff. And it's happening all over the bay. Um, I also read about fines that East Bay Mud and other utilities districts are paying. Do you see any prospects for really um, changing this in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, and uh, it was total oversight on my part to not think to talk more about our sewage spill work. So thank you for asking this question. For the other folks in the room, I did not plant Ellen and Tom <laughs> with that question. Um, so yes, sewage spills are a huge problem in the Bay, mostly because our infrastructure is crumbling. It was built you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, and that just means that um, the pipes are not what they used to be. And because they're underground, they're out of sight and out of mind. So when city budgets come around and they are looking for funds, they raid the wastewater maintenance funds all the time, even though they're not supposed to, um, because that's an easy way to say, well, we'll just borrow from here. That's not an issue. Um, so that's why Baykeeper has over the last, I would say 15 years, identified the biggest sewage spill polluters um, and we have systematically gone through each and every one of them and sued that city in order to hold them accountable and make them prioritize fixing their systems. So we actually do have litigation uh, against East Bay Mud and all of its satellite systems. So that includes Berkeley. Um, that litigation was settled, I want to say, da, 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 da back, I think about 2012-ish. Um, and it's because these are such monstrous, expensive problems and issues, um, it, it's a, I believe it's a 20 year settlement agreement. So over a 20 year period, East Bay Mud and the cities are ratcheting down the problems by investing in their systems. So Baykeeper gets annual reports from the cities we um, watchdog them, we watchdog East Bay Mud, and we make sure that they're complying with the progress that is required under the, the agreement. So um, East Bay Mud is a huge system and it's gonna take a while, but we've had big success down in the South Bay with the smaller systems in actually getting those systems into compliance within 10 years. So we have a number of cities in the South Bay that are actually at zero spill rates or close to zero spill rates um, after the litigation that we've brought. So it is a successful campaign, but it takes a while to get done. Um, and you know the, the pipes aren't getting any younger as we continue to, to keep going. So um, more pipes and more cities are starting to have problems and we are keeping track of that. Um, but there's also only so much a little team of Baykeeper lawyers and scientists can do. We're a team of 12 and we have to prioritize. So um, keep that support coming <laughs> and we can have more staff and work on these issues more. Um, but yes, that's a great question. Um, let's see, Jan? Yeah, um, I have a question to uh, that example you mentioned with the um, shipyard or a similar um, uh, company that um, released their uh, debris, sand blasting debris into the bay. Uh, I, I keep being amazed at the mindset of people who just do that. 
um, and then once they get sued, they clean it up. Do you ever get a reaction like, "Oh, we were going to do that anyway," or something like that? Or what? 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 what how, how? How do the people react, or, or do they ever justify why they were doing it without even thinking that it might not be a good idea? Oh my gosh! I think in my 18 years, I have heard every excuse under the sun. <laughs> you name it, and I have heard it. Um, most of the time they plead ignorance and they say, oh, we had no idea. You know, we were in between environmental monitoring staff. And so we just didn't realize, or we didn't know that that was a law or a requirement. But, um, but they, they had reported themselves according to your story, right? Yes, exactly. Um, so many times they just, this is what they say, that they just take the samples they send it to the lab, they get the lab report and they submit it to the agency because that's what they're required to do. But they they claim that they don't actually know what numbers they're supposed to be complying with. Um, so they don't they do their self reporting as required by the law, but they don't actually do anything about the high numbers of pollutants that are in that report and in their stormwater discharges. So it's kind of a it's definitely a, a facetious game that they play um, because they know that the government agency is probably unlikely to hold them accountable. And if they do hold them accountable, it's typically a slap on the wrist fine. Um, and so that just means that they often take their chances, they try to get away with as much as they can. And then if they're caught, they pay the fine and then they keep going on as usual. So uh, a lot of facilities are really upset by Baykeeper. You know, they, they don't like that we're out there, that we are watchdogging them. Um, but on the flip side, it's our work and our presence has also caused a lot of facilities to proactively contact us and say, we don't want to be sued by you. <laughs> Tell us what to do. Um, or if we do sue them, we've had many, many companies actually come to us after the, the negotiations and say, you guys were so much more reasonable than we realized you would be. It was such a pleasure working with you. We are so glad we are now in compliance with the law and we wished we would have done this sooner because it was not as painful as we thought it was gonna be. Um, and I, I keep kicking myself because every time I, I hear that gratitude, I, I kind of hold it close and, and it inspires me to keep doing my work. But I realized that I should actually get them to give me those quotes so I can put them up on our website and promote them because um, it's not that often that you think of, of polluters thanking people for suing them. So one of these well, days, particularly, I'll, I'll... I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. That that might actually be a really good message to get out there. Hey, it's not that painful to not damage or keep damaging the environment. Yeah. It only takes a little getting over the activation energy hump or something like that. Yeah. That, that. That's a really nice story. Yeah. I know. We just, just hired a communications person this year. So we've never had one before. So maybe we'll be able to really get around to doing some good messaging and raising visibility around these issues more. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see, I see um, ag runoff. Yes, definitely an issue. Um, we, Baykeeper, actually it was my fellowship project to work on the first agricultural waivers um, in California. So this was the first law in the country actually that required pesticide regulation at um, from farms uh, because as some of you might realize that there's a big that loophole uh, in the Clean Water Act that doesn't require any sort of regulation of farm runoff and farm pollution. And so we were instrumental in getting the first law passed back, this was back in 2002, 2005. Um, and since then, there have been some strides that have been made throughout California on trying to close that ag runoff um, issue. Um, Let's see, dust from Schnitzer in Oakland, oh, I know. Actually, actually, Nadia had her hand up. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Nadia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I had a question about container ships and overseas transport. 
I'm a wine importer. So for a living, I import wine from France directly into the port of Oakland. And of course, I, I'm focused solely on organic and biodynamic, very small production uh, farmers. So trying to work with a sustainable, environmentally um, uh, responsible product as possible, but I can't get around the overseas shipping. And, you know, that's something I contract out to major companies to do. And I've never really fully thought through how, what is the environmental impact and specifically on such a major port like, um, like ours? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so much of it for the port side is um, air pollution that we're dealing with. And that's not something that's specifically in Baykeeper's wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. um, we do watchdog the port facilities from having stormwater runoff and other kinds of water pollution from their, from their sites and their operations. And of course we watchdog any kinds of um, ship traffic and the, the pollution problems that they have there. Um, but I'm not as familiar with the, the energy costs and the carbon you know, costs of, of shipping that, you know, that happened in the Bay Area, especially. Um, so I don't know, maybe there's somebody else here who has, uh, who has information on that or a good resource for that. I can try to think about um, who might have more information on that and send it to you if you want to send me your email. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Um, Alan and Tom, hi follow-up question about these container ships, um, you may have noticed, we've all noticed paddling, that there's a whole lot more ships hanging out in the South Bay and Anchorages 8 and 9, as well as uh, an equal number or larger offshore, off, off the bay, waiting to be unloaded or, or to load. And um, I'm wondering, um, are they being monitored for possible pollution releases like sewage and bilge water and oil and and so forth. Yes, we are on patrol closely monitoring those waiting ships because um, you guys have probably seen in the news as, Ellen, as Tom was just referring to, um, the, the increase in pandemic shipments and, and uh, orders through Amazon and stuff have really increased cargo traffic on the bay. Um, so there's not enough space at the ports to, to bring in all these ships at the same time. So they're having to wait at Anchorage 9, they're having to wait out in the ocean. And um, definitely for the ones at Anchorage 9, we are regularly monitoring those, uh, those vessels when we're on patrol um, because we've actually caught some of them polluting. Um, there was just a couple of years ago, I was lucky, lucky enough to be on patrol that day um, I, it's kind of exciting, I have to say, to catch a polluter red-handed, but obviously really, really bad for the Bay, so I don't, I don't want to pretend otherwise. Um, but we were uh, at Anchorage 9, we were going through the vessels and um, saw this one that was just gushing water off of its deck. And what they were doing was basically washing down everything, all of their mechanical equipment, and letting it just dump right into the bay. And the bay was like this foamy, brownish, soapy water that was just discharged all over the bay. So we took samples, we took photos and, and video evidence and turned them into the DA and uh, the San Francisco DA's office. Um, and the San Francisco DA's office has a warrant out for the, I don't know, apprehension of the vessel owners if they ever come back to the bay. So um, yeah, that is pretty, pretty uh, standard procedure on patrols to get out there and, and monitor those vessels. Um, let's see, Schnitzer, yes. Schnitzer, uh, Oakland Estuary, big metal polluter. Uh, that's a facility that we have been watchdogging for a number of years. We actually were building a lawsuit against them um, because we had seen and, and had evidence of pollution from their facility. Um, and then when we notified the agency that we were going to bring our legal action, uh, because we have to do that under the Clean Water Act, the agency actually stepped in and said, oh, no, wait, this one's ours. This is a big polluter. You guys can't handle them. Um, and so they, the agency ended up trying to get this facility, Schnitzer, into compliance. 
And eight years later, the facility has not improved one iota. I will tell you guys, San Francisco Baykeepers litigation results in settlement agreements that are three years long. And at that third year, that facility is in compliance. So um, it was really disappointing to us that the, the water board was not able to hold Schnitzer accountable. So we've actually been working other channels um, to try to get that site cleaned up. And you guys may have heard the recent um, A's lawsuit against Schnitzer, crazy politics there, but we were very in support of getting Schnitzer cleaned up. And so we did actually file an amicus brief in court to support that litigation and we won. So um, Schnitzer is required now to clean up their site in a way that we think is gonna be more protective of the Bay. So we're very excited about that. Um, that that's great because I remember paddling on the estuary and you can taste the metal coming out of that facility when you're paddling. That is a story. When, oh my gosh. Yeah, the dust in the dust. It's just, I mean, the amount of dust that comes in to the bay is awful. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really scary. We should, we should get you saying that actually. That would be interesting um, as a kayaker. Um, I see Someone asking, Paul is asking, are fish caught in the bay safe to eat? It sort of depends on which fish you're talking about, um, how big they are and what kinds of pollution they've been exposed to. Um, I, I think, I, I don't remember the recommendations off the top of my head, but many of the fish in the bay have been exposed to mercury, um, selenium, PCBs, other toxic chemicals and heavy metals. And so um, I, I believe for mercury in particular, it's not safe to eat the fish, um, but there are guidelines on um, kind of how many you can catch a month and how many you can eat a month. And uh, you just wanna follow those guidelines pretty carefully and make sure that you're not eating too many fish out of the bay. Um, and then soon, hopefully one day, we will have cleaner fish. Uh, Baykeeper actually did work on the mercury cleanup plan for the Bay. Uh, this was another fun story of government agencies not doing their job. Um, mercury is obviously a big problem in the Bay. It's a legacy pollutant from the gold mining days. Um, and the Bay is so toxically laden with mercury that it's um, listed as impaired under the Clean Water Act for mercury. So uh, the water board, the agency is required to create a cleanup plan. And what they ended up doing was saying, well, our cleanup plan is gonna be 120 years long and we're just gonna make the action, um, all of the, the polluted mercury, sand and sediment in the bay over that 120 years is just gonna wash out of the bay. And so that's, that's the action that we're gonna take to clean up the bay. <laughs> And so we said, well, that defies the spirit of the Clean Water Act. Um, and so uh, we worked really hard to get them to actually identify current sources of mercury, identify um, old mines that were still contributing mercury to the Bay's watershed, and to come up with a more reasonable 20-year plan to ratchet down the mercury levels in the Bay. Um, and that was really Baykeeper um, taking the lead on that because the agency really was shrugging its shoulders and saying there's nothing we can do about that. So that was um, that was actually one of my first forays into government agencies really aren't doing their job <laughs> unless you make them. Uh, that was back in 2006, 2007. Um, yeah, Jan just asked if we see something, we wanna say something, how can we re report observations? Um, and thank you, Jonathan, for putting up our our hotline number. So we've got 1-800-KEEP-BAY is the best way to reach out to us if you're on the water. Um, or if you're back at home and you're on your computer, um, you can always jump on our website. Um, that's baykeeper.org. And uh, the most important thing is probably photos. So if you can grab photos or if there's a polluter you're worried about, if you can grab video and send those to us, that really helps. Um, okay. I think I answered all the questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. That's great.
Thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, we should probably uh, wrap it up at 9 o'clock. Our planning meetings on May 11th. It's going to have some important stuff. You should come and uh, check out the Baykeeper website. Yay. So anything else before we go? Important? I think we're good. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Great night. Thank you. Wonderful. Great talk.